Good morning and welcome to May the 14th as we start a new sermon series called Songs of Hope. We start with probably the best known psalm of all of them. And all we have for this morning is just one single verse. We'll take a few weeks to work our way through the rest of the verses. But this morning, just very simply put, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd. And Lord, thank you that he is our shepherd. He is my shepherd. And so help us learn more about this wonderful shepherd who cares for us. And as we work our way through the psalm in the next several weeks, let us celebrate together the wonderful truths that it teaches us, not just celebrate, but experience them. We ask in the name of our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I said, this is beyond doubt the most well-known of all the psalms. It's probably the most well-loved of all the psalms, and I would think of all of them, this has been memorized more than the rest of them probably put together. It's read to children at nighttime. It's read to patients who are in ICU by their family members and loved ones. And I read it at nearly every funeral I conduct because one of the verses reminds us Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for thou art with me. It's a good reminder to those of us who are remembering our loved one that has just passed, that they've gone through that valley. It's a shadow. They've gone to be with the Lord. And one day, unless Christ comes back in our lifetime, we will pass through that valley ourselves. But we're reminded in the psalm that the Lord is with us, even as we go through the valley. Its words were meant to be encouraging, comforting, and calming at all times of our lives. It was probably penned by David, I'm gonna guess, just a little later on in his life. There's no, what's known as a superscription or a little title saying David when he fled from Saul, or David when he was fleeing from Absalom, or David when he was in the wilderness. Um, so it doesn't give a time frame for us, but I think it was penned by David later in life when he looked back at how God had provided and cared and guided him. And as he was reaching the end of his life, he makes the declaration in the very last verse, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So it is not just the Lord being with us and providing for us here, but providing a place for us in the hereafter, in the next life, in eternity. And we will go and we will dwell in the Lord's house forever. That's our hope. Philip Keller wrote a wonderful book on Psalm 23 entitled, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. He spent some time shepherding because he wanted to learn more about this um, way of life that most of us don't know much about today. There are times during spring when the alfalfa grows in the fields around here and they'll bring the sheep down from the higher elevations and they'll graze in the alfalfa, they'll set aside a pasture area and the sheep mow it down pretty good. And then they'll move them to the next area and to the next area and so that's about the closest that we can get to sheep living in city life now. But it was a very common thing to see in the life of Israel. Uh, nearly everyone would come across them, not just in passing through the pasture lands, but they would come across them at Passover every year. And they would come across them during all the sacrifices that were done every time they went to the tabernacle in the wilderness or the temple, when it was built, morning and evening, there was a lamb that was given for our sake. So Philip Keller decided, I'm going to spend some time learning how to shepherd. And he writes this, When all is said and done, the well-being of every flock is entirely dependent 
upon the care given to them by their owner. The tenant sheep herder, the hireling on the farm next to my first ranch, was the most indifferent manager I'd ever met. He was not concerned about the condition of the sheep. His land was neglected. He gave little or no time to his flock, letting them pretty well forage for themselves as best as they could, both summer and winter. Thus they fell prey to dogs, cougars, and rustlers. Every year these poor creatures were forced to gnaw away at bare brown fields and impoverished pastures. Every winter there was a shortage of nourishing hay and wholesome grain to feed the hungry ewes. Shelter to safeguard and protect the suffering sheep from storms and blizzards was scanty and inadequate. They had only polluted muddy water to drink. There had been a lack of salt and other trace minerals needed to offset their sickly pastures. In their thin, weak, and diseased condition, these poor sheep were a pathetic sight. In my mind's eye, I can still see them standing at the fence, huddled together, sadly in tight little knots, staring wistfully through the wires at the rich pastures on the other side of the fence. To all their distress, the heartless, selfish owner seemed utterly callous and indifferent. He simply didn't care. What if his sheep did want green grass, fresh water, shade, safety, or shelter from the storms? What if they did want relief from wounds, bruises, disease, parasites? He ignored their needs. He couldn't care less. Why should he? To him, they were just sheep, someone else's sheep, destined simply for the slaughterhouse. I become increasingly aware of one thing, and it is this. It is the shepherd, the master, in people's lives that makes all the difference in their destiny. So the question is, who is your shepherd? People too often think, or at least hope, that in most of life, we have a great amount of capacity to make decisions regarding so much stuff that comes into our lives. In other words, we want to be the master of this and the master of that. We want to make decisions about the events in our life. We insist on what might be called autonomy or self-rule. We insist on making our own choices. It doesn't take long for the young ones growing up to learn one of the first words beside mama and daddy is no. I know my mom never taught me how to say no to her. We never taught our kids how to say no to us. I remember seeing a mom with a t-shirt in a grocery store and the t-shirt simply read, what part of no didn't you understand? Ruling our own lives has been a human tendency and problem since the garden. For God said to them, of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, except for one. And they decided that God was not going to be the Lord in that decision. They were going to be. So the woman took from the tree, gave it to her husband, who was with her, and they decided they were going to be Lord over that situation. That they owned themselves. They had the right to make their own decisions. And we own our future. But as they discovered, and as we do also, our insistence on self-ownership starts to show cracks as we make a poor decision, followed by another poor decision, followed by a third poor decision. And suddenly those cracks widen, become fissures, and we fall down into them, and we wonder why we've lost all control in our life. It's because we've insisted on having control, and when God lets us experience self-control, in other words, our choice, we'll find out that it just doesn't go well. So when the storms of life and the fires, have you seen the fires along the coast in South Orange County? Laguna Niguel destroying million dollar mansions. When the droughts of life come in, which we have experienced now, 
I understand third year in a row, and our uh, reservoirs are at the lowest point in quite a long time. When that happens, we discover we're actually not in control of what we think that we are in control of. And lastly, when illness, sickness, and the valley of the shadow of death arrives, we will find out for sure that being Lord of all by ourselves, self-lordship, will show itself in absolute weakness and helplessness in the face of death. Some years ago, I came across an article written by Katie Howard. I just want to read her little bio that she put at the end of her article. She described herself this way. Christian, wife, mommy, writer, musician, working on giving all of myself up to Jesus. I am not in control, even though I want to be. Isn't there not just a shred of truth, but a lot of truth inside that? How often do we have circumstances happen in our lives and we never really verbalize it, or maybe we would. We would say, if I were God, I would. Right? And when we say, if I were God, I would, what we're in essence saying is that God's not running his universe as well as we would, or we could, or he should. Isn't that true? I mean, in all honesty, that's what it comes down to. Because we're reminded to bring everything to the Lord in prayer. And if we bring everything to the Lord in prayer, then the assumption is in prayer, you give him your pain, your hurt, your problem, your trouble, your illness, whatever, your grief, whatever it is, you say, Lord, here it is. It's too much for me. And if we're doing that, then in essence, we're saying, we're not in charge and we're not capable of taking care of this. And that should work its way through every area of life. I'm not in control, even though I want to be. That describes some of us most of the time and all of us in honesty, some of the time. We don't like how our life, our little world is turning out. And so, we push, we clamor, we insist that we know better and the world better change according to my rules because we know best. But we are not in control. We found out very quickly when a car veers into our lane in front of us in the highway, we're not in control. When we've eaten as healthy as possible and taken time on most days to stretch and get some reasonable exercise, get out for a walk, then an illness hits that sideswipes us. Just think of the myriad of issues facing America today that are out of, out of any one single person's control. Gas prices, the accusations go back and forth about whose fault it is, right? There's the blame game, doesn't fix it. Rental rates, home prices, interest rates, food shortages. At the top of the list right now is baby formula shortages. Have you seen the reports and pictures of empty shelves across America? Although there is some evidence that our government officials have stockpiled baby formula, which would normally fill the shelves of our stores and they are stockpiled along our border due to what I heard was government regulations. Now, as much as I care, obviously, about all moms and all babies, everyone around the world, it's been horrific as we've watched the pictures and videos come out of the Ukraine and you see grandmas with very little leaving their homes that are bombed and devastated moms carrying kids. It's a terrible thing to see. We care about each and every mom. However, we have a responsibility to feed our own families first. Then, as God enables us to take care of others who are in need, that is the biblical method of doing it. 
So can I offer you a verse about that? You bet I can. First Timothy chapter five, verse eight. So where is it found that we are responsible for family first? Paul writes, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's it. So this verse teaches us that our primary responsibility is for our families. If we have brought children into the world, we are responsible for our children. We are. The government doesn't own them. The school doesn't own them. God has given them to us for a short period of time in order for us to teach them about the Lord and raise them morally straight and give them good principles and values that will serve them well. And hopefully they'll become fruitful, socially giving, productive people, not just in America. My prayer would be that moms and dads everywhere would do that. So we're responsible first for our families, then our extended families. Grandma, grandpa, grandkids, cousins, people related, then our neighborhood, then our country. And then as we are able, it is a good thing, as we are able to give to people who are in need. The Bible says that. But our family first. Back to Katie Howard's statement, I'm not in control even though I want to be. Since God created all of it, that is everything, then he has the right and ability, the right and the ability to run it as he sees fit. The end of the book of Job raises those questions with Job and his three friends as God begins asking Job some questions. And I have no doubt that his three friends probably heard the conversation also. And the questions began like this. Job, where were you when I made everything? Job, tell me how I did it. Job, when you look at it all, can you do what I've done? And if the answer to that is, you weren't here when I made it, you don't know how I did it, and you can't run it like I do, then why don't you let me run my universe? Why accuse me of doing a poor job of taking care of what I've created? David says, the Lord is my shepherd. My life will be a lot more content when I let God be God and let Greg be Greg. Just settle that issue once and for all. Who is God? He is. Who's Lord? He is. Who's shepherd? He is. And because of that, David writes, and we'll begin that, a look at that next week, but it's a good reminder, since the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I shall not lack, I shall be taken care of. He's a good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. That means we're sheep. People don't care too much to be compared to sheep. If you've ever hung around pretty close, they look really cute until you have to start taking care of them. And then they kind of lose their cuteness. Sheep don't tend to rise very high on the animal IQ list. They are easily outdone by monkeys, raccoons, rats, yes, elephants, dogs, dolphins, and even pigs. Yes, pigs. So why does God liken us to sheep? Here's the reasons why. First, sheep are herd animals. They herd together. They stick together. That's really good for keeping warm on cold winter nights when you see them gather together and huddle together and keep each other warm. But it works out very bad when one sheep takes off in the wrong direction and a lot of other <clears throat> sheep follow that one sheep going the wrong way. Didn't you ever grow up and your mom would say something like, well, if everyone else decided to jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? Or if everyone else decided, I mean, I always have these momisms. I've often wondered, when, <clears throat> mom, when you were raising your girls, did you bring them in and sit them down one day and say, 
here's a list of questions I want to give you that you can ask your kids when you have kids, you know? <laughs> so here's the first one. If everyone else jumped off a bridge, would you jump off the bridge too? Memorize that one. So you can say to your kids, they all seem to have the same momisms. Sheep have that follow the leader instinct, which is good when their leader's going in the right direction. But when they have a bad leader, evidence today, and they're willing to follow, then disaster is the result. And it's even worse if they have an evil leader. Then it becomes destructive, not just to them, but to society. Next, sheep have poor depth perception. They really can't tell exactly how far an object is away. And when they see something that they're unfamiliar with, they tend to scatter because they really don't know what that person or object or enemy is. However, sheep do have excellent hearing. They have a capacity to pinpoint sound as a lot of animals do as they are able to direct their ears and get some sense of 360 sound. They can hear the voice of their shepherd. And Jesus even went on to say, said, they know my voice. I'm the good shepherd. He said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Another one they will not follow. So sheep become very familiar with the voice of the shepherd. That excellent hearing, however, means that they're easily frightened by sudden loud noises. They like calm and peace. And when one becomes frightened, what happens? The herd instinct kicks in and they all become frightened. They share a sense of the same emotions running together. Next, sheep have an excellent sense of smell. They can smell pastures not very far away. They can smell water not very far away. I wish I had a list of animals I could tell you about. They can smell water at miles and miles of distances. It's astounding what God has created and put in his world. Sheep have big appetites. As a matter of fact, Probably most of what they do is eat and sleep and eat and eat and sleep and eat and nap and eat and just hang around and eat. Have you got like an Uncle Ephus in your family that makes every Thanksgiving gathering a grazing event and then a nap event and then another grazing event as you get another plate load and have that and then go and take another nap? Next to a good herding dog, the best way to gather sheep together is to put some food out. It's true. Just put some good food out and you, you get with people also. Tell folks we've got some food and they'll be there. Sheep can be very mean. The males, especially, or rams, can be aggressive during mating season. Headbutting is the preferred method of clearing your opponent away from your girlfriend or moving your opponent away from the fried chicken at the buffet table. Sheep can be irrational. They don't think things through. They don't think about the logical end of if I leave and head over that cliff, what's going to happen? If we leave the pasture land and wander away, what's going to happen? They just don't put a series of events together and figure out if I go the wrong direction. When they encounter a stream, they're not sure whether to slowly wade in or jump in. They'll stop in front of the stream and then due to their lack of depth perception, they'll jump in maybe and find out that the water's moving too quickly for them. He brings me beside the still waters. David writes, safe waters. We'll look at that again. Sheep are slow to learn. Yes, one of the things that shepherds have is a shepherd's staff. It signifies several things. One of the things it helps them do is gather the sheep together as they can kind of poke and prod and give them a little nudge and sometimes a little bit more of a whack. <laughs> 
to keep them together and going in the right direction. One of them will get caught in a fence in the barbed wire and get tangled and will bleat and bleat and stay there just absolutely helpless until the shepherd comes by and frees the sheep. Sheep are stubborn. When they don't want to, they just don't want to. They're almost impossible to move. I remember, gosh, maybe a dozen years ago or so, perhaps, uh, Lynn and I, we went to Oatman, Arizona. I don't know if you've ever been in Oatman. It's up on the old 66 highway, and they've got uh, wild burrows that just come into town during the day and head out into the hillsides at nighttime. And um, in order for the capacity to have tourists come and visit, they allow these uh, wild animals to come in town, then they sell little cubes of alfalfa and some other goods. Well, uh, Lynn had gone to the store and bought something and she had a plastic sack and one of the burros thought there was food inside the sack and she was sitting down on a, uh, a bench next to the opening of the store, the entrance of the store. And they call them Jacks and Jills, actually. I don't know whether it was a Jack or a Jill, but he leaned into her and she said, help me, I need to get out, he's leaning on me, he's leaning on me. So I put my arm around the neck of this pretty sizable burrow and tried to pull him away. And guess who won that tug of war contest? It wasn't me. The harder I tugged, the more he leaned. Eventually, he got the idea. I don't know whether I gave him a quick slap on the hindquarters or what, but eventually got the idea. Didn't want him there anymore, but he was pretty, he was insistent that there was something in that bag and he was going to get whatever it was out of that bag. Sheep are wanderers. Leave them in an open field and they'll move toward food with their head down. They graze, just head down constantly, which means they're really not on the watch for enemies like they should be. They need a shepherd to help them with that. It's easy to leave little bits of food on a trail that leads them to slaughter. They'll just follow the trail. Sheep are very dependent animals. Some animals thrive with very little human interaction, like feral cats. They just do well in the alleys and almost everywhere in the city, but not sheep. They need a shepherd. So David writes, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one who cares for me. So who, who is the Lord and what is he like? Well, as I said, it's very important to know who the master of your life is. Is it you? Is it a, an ism today? And by isms, I mean like secularism, humanism. People have sold their souls for these isms of today. Is it the Lord? Well, let me give you a verse series of them from Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 8. Moses had been praying, and his request was, Lord, that I might see your glory. And so God granted that Moses would see his glory, except not in fullness. God said, no man can see my glory and live. What I will do, though, is put you in a cleft of a rock and cover you with my hand, and I will pass by. And so the Bible says in Exodus 34, verses 5 to 8, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he, that is Moses, called on the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed. Now, listen to this. When Moses said, I want to see your glory, most people think that God's glory is just some great, bright, shining light. Well, it is true that God's Shekinah glory is that, but God doesn't consider his glory anything other than his perfect, pure, unchangeable character. His glory is who he is. So the Lord proclaims, this is my glory. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Think of those terms for just a moment. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate, 
gracious. The first two characteristics that God tells Moses about are some of the ones that I need the most. Compassion and grace. And why is he compassionate and gracious? It is because he is slow to anger. That's why. If God were quick to anger, I wouldn't be standing here this morning. But because he is slow to anger, he is gracious and abounding in loving kindness. Not just a little bit, but abounding in it. Paul writes and says, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Abounding in loving kindness and truth. You'd think that would be enough for me. Just stop there, God, and that's good enough. But he doesn't. He says he keeps loving kindness for thousands. How does he keep his loving kindness for us? The problem is I create a problem in my relationship with the Lord, and it's found in these next words. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. That's what we've done. Why does he forgive? Because he is compassionate and gracious. Why is he compassionate and gracious? Because he is slow to anger. And he abounds in loving kindness and in truth also. When we come to the Lord, and if we say we have no sin, then we make it out as if God is a liar for telling us that we have sin. However, John says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't this wonderful? So when I talk about psalms of hope, I, my desire is every week as you leave, you'll spend a little time just focusing on this, concentrating it, and as you do, the world's problems, as bad as they are, should become smaller in your sight and the greatness of God become bigger in your sight. Amen. It says he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. But God does not overlook wrongdoing as if what is happening in the world he is uncaring about or unjust about. No, he is a holy God and he is judge also. So it says he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generations, it says. How does God do that and what does that mean? Well, the word iniquity has the idea of twistedness in it. It means bad character. Sin, actually, is a word that describes our best efforts that come short. Everything that we do is marked by imperfection. Everything that sin falls short of the mark. Transgression has the idea that God draws a line and says, don't cross that. God builds a fence, says, don't climb over it. God says, here's attitudes and actions that are not to be a part of your life. And transgression means that we just go ahead and do it anyway, even though we know better. The word iniquity, as I said, has the idea of bentness or twistedness. It's character that's formed the wrong way. And what happens when God visits that iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren? They watch mom and dad. They watch their bad habits. And they learn to do exactly what mom and dad have been doing for generations. So you see what's called generational sin work its way through life of this generation and the next one and the next one, and all it does is get worse. What does it take? Can it be helped? Absolutely. Jesus Christ steps in and stops it. He stops it. Why? Because he is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. Because he forgives sin, iniquity, and transgression. And Moses' response to that is found in the eighth verse. He made haste quickly he bowed down toward the earth and he worshiped. What was he worshiping? Not some great light. 
What was he worshiping? Who was he worshiping? He was worshiping the Lord, the Lord God, who described himself this way. That's the same Lord God that David says, that's my shepherd. That person who describes himself this way, that's my shepherd. That powerful declaration about God is repeated. It's found in Nehemiah chapter 9, Psalm 86, Psalm 103, Psalm 111, Joel chapter 2, and Jonah chapter 4. This is not an isolated declaration by God. Matter of fact, when God tells us something two or three times, it should be an attention grabber. When he tells us six or seven times, he means to imprint, impress that on us so deeply that it will become the guiding principle of our life, the character of God, the Lord is my shepherd. So what does it say about then this Lord? Well, the Bible teaches us these things. In the beginning was God. Before there was anything, there was God. God is self-existent. That means he is uncreated. God is not dependent upon anyone or anything. We are dependent on God. And since God is not dependent upon anyone or anything, that's good for us. If God had needs and they weren't met, he couldn't take care of us. But since God does not have needs, what he did was create us who do have needs and teaches us to depend upon him for our needs and promises he'll take care of them because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's all powerful. What does that mean? He can do anything that is good and righteous. That's what's meant by that. He cannot do evil. Not just that he doesn't want to or could. He cannot. It is impossible for God to do wrong. And that's good for us too, which means he will only do what is good and right for us. He will never wrong you. The Lord of all creation took some dust from the ground and made you and me. That's what we're made out of, the dust of the ground. But we were made in a very different and special way that all the rest of everything that populates the earth. He did one thing to that first man that he did not do to all the rest of creation. He breathed into that man the breath of life. He gave his spirit. And in giving his spirit, he molded that man and the woman, both made in the image of God. That is why we have such dignity. That is why we have value. That is why that baby that is conceived in the womb has great value and great dignity because God created that child in his own image because Jesus Christ took on the same humanity, sinless, but the same humanity as that child in the womb and died for that child in the womb and died for all of us. So we are valuable. Why? Not for any other reason, but that God values us. That's good news, isn't it? Other people will weigh out what you can do for them. Can you do a certain job? They'll pay you a certain amount of money. Not God. We're valuable. So valuable, he said, that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's how much. Do you belong to him? Are you part of his flock? Can you say this morning, the Lord is my shepherd. The Bible has wonderful adjectives to describe the shepherd. He calls himself the good shepherd. Obviously, there must be bad shepherds. There are hirelings, he said. He's not one of them. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is infinite. He is eternal. He is always truthful. He is merciful. He is trustworthy. He is faithful to many generations. He is abundant in loving kindness. He is joyful, and he wants to share his joy with us, that my joy may be in you. He is all-knowing. Nothing is hidden from his sight. 
There's nothing that can be known that God does not know. He is wise, all wise, only wise. He is just, perfect in his justice, kind, patient, meek, lowly, humble is how he describes himself. And most wonderfully, they accused him of being a friend of sinners. I'm so glad he decided to sit down with sinners. That's why he sat down with me, came into my life. If that were not the truth, again, I wouldn't be here this morning. He is the good shepherd who actively goes looking for the lost sheep. He says he counts them. And when one is gone, he leaves the 99 and goes and climbs the hills and valleys and mountains and wherever to go find that one lost sheep. And when he comes home, he comes home rejoicing. It's a parable that he teaches about that. Man found a sheep come and says, come celebrate with me. Come celebrate. He is everything you could ever want and everything you could ever need. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you in the name of our good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to bless this to us. May it encourage us, strengthen us, comfort, and always bring hope to us. We pray for the glory of Jesus, for the building of his kingdom, and ultimately, Heavenly Father, for your glory. We ask in his name.